And now we're ready to finish all of the ornithitions, and we're going to do that by finishing the ornithopods. We already talked about the heterodontosaurids and the hypsilophodontids. Well, there are two other families we need to worry about in this ornithopoda, and they are the iguanodontidae and the hadrosauridae. So let's look at these things. The iguanodontidae are interesting because they are among the earliest of these groups, and they were huge. Look at this. They can be up to 10 meters in length. From looking at them, they were what we would say mostly bipedal. There's clearly track evidence that many times they walked on all fours, but sometimes they got up and walked on their hind two limbs. They um, are also noted for having uh, thumbs, or the fifth digit on the hand, as a spiky extension, literally a thumb spike. They have also a distinctive feature of having a large head and a broad toothless beak. And here, for example, is Oranosaurus, classic feature of this. And you can see the little lines across here, huge vertebral column and ossified tendons there as well. A couple of artists' representations of these things, both in the bipedal and in the quadrupedal postures. So they would do both. But the dinosaur that's most associated with this family is, of course, Iguanodon. And again, you see here the prominent thumb spike, uh, and then a fifth digit, which is very long. They had many, many, many more teeth than the heterodontids or the hypsilophodontids, mostly because they've got a long extended face. And so they're, they're kind of even more of an eating, eating machine. And so those are the iguanodontidae. Then those are contrasted with the family Hadrosauridae, which are colloquially termed the duck-billed dinosaurs. And they are the group that largely replaces the iguanodontids. So the iguanodontids were from the early, maybe to the middle of the Cretaceous. The Hadrosaurides are from the middle to the latest Cretaceous, K being the German symbol K for Cretaceous. Again, another large creature up to 10 meters in length. Both bipedal ones and quadrupedal ones, and then all of them interspersed with uh, both lifestyles at different times. They are distinct for having the most uh, broad and wide toothless beaks, and then huge intricate dental batteries with interlocking teeth. Many, many, many replacements. They don't have digit one, so the hands have only four digits, and one of those is a spike. Interesting, interesting group. And then within the family Hadrosauridae, remember we talked about this before, sometimes you need to subdivide them. We've subdivided them into two different subfamilies, the subfamily Hadrosaurini, and you see the picture of them up there. Uh, flat skull roofs, perhaps they were in, able to be inflated and things like that. Um, the classic Roman nose with a big bump in it. Uh, long nasal passages perched at the very end of the, um, uh, of the, of the creature here. Uh, and then we have the subfamily Lambia Sorini, and these are the ones that have these huge crests long tubular nasal passages in here. So the from the nostrils, you've got a nasal passage that goes way up into the head of this thing and back down to connect with the mouth. There's clear evidence of sexual dimorphism in these because we find some with pronounced longer horns and others with shorter ones. And here the thought is that maybe these were... Uh, very good or very loud noisemakers. So the sound of um, air echoing through this chamber would have been quite piercing. Again, one of our slides that shows both the bone view, what we have, and then an artist's reconstruction. And you see here a rather large um, herbivorous dinosaur. 
And one aspect or one way they were able to get large were have these highly ossified tendons to strengthen the back to support this huge, huge animal. But interestingly enough, most people like to talk about their crests, their noses, etc. And so you've got several different dinosaurs here, the Corythosaurs, Parasaurolophus, and Lambiosaurus. And again, you see the nasal passages in this cross-hatched area, very, very, very large. And as I mentioned before, there is some evidence of sexual dimorphism, males with longer, straighter crests, females with shorter, more curved crests. Interesting, interesting group. And then another sort of representation here of one of these huge, huge lambiosaurs in its quadrupedal posture. Notice the uh, wild um, color reconstruction this artist used. But it is being attacked, but not by some large, large, even larger carnivorous beast, but by a team of smaller organisms here. Now, all of the ornithicians that we've talked about so far, from ankylosaurs to stegosaurs to pachycephalosaurs, ceratopsians, these ornithopods, they've all been herbivorous. But there certainly were carnivorous dinosaurs at this time as well. And here's some examples of these things. And they're not all giants like T. rex and all that, but we're going to get there. We're almost there. This ends the Ornithischia. We've concluded this part of this course.